Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Oxford Martin School. Um, my name is Jim Hall, and I'm chairing this evening's um, uh, lecture and discussion on um, the impacts of large dams. There could hardly be a more controversial artifact of infrastructure than large dams, um, which is what we're going to be discussing this evening. Uh, we recognize that large dams uh, impact aquatic ecosystems in dramatic ways. They submerge terrestrial ecosystems. Um, they displace people, uh, often associated with appropriation of land. Um, and as we'll particularly focus on this evening, they have a very significant impacts on uh, downstream water resources and the use of, of water by downstream riparians. Um, but on the other hand, dams provide a, essential storage of water, which um, around the world, particularly in places with very high hydrological variability, seasonal interannual variability, um, it would literally be hard to imagine how uh, civilization could function um, without them. Um, they provide essential storage of water for irrigation purposes. Um, I saw from the UN that um, the world's population in June 2022 is estimated to be 8.0 billion. Um, we've just crossed the 8 billion mark. Um, and it would be hard to see how we could uh, feed that 8 billion people without irrigated agriculture. Um, and uh, cities, civilization um, depends upon municipal water supplies. Five years ago, Cape Town was uh, approaching um, a day zero um, when the water in the reservoirs there was um, just about exhausted. And um, large dams provide hydropower, which is uh, literally a renewable um, form of energy. And it's a, it's a form of energy with a, a, a double bonus in the context of um, intermittent, so wind and solar energy supplies, is that hydropower can, can provide the um, backup, the immediate dispatchable power, um, which matches beautifully with intermittent renewables, um, in particular, if one does that with pumped hydro storage. Um, so there's, there's quite a balance sheet there that we have to, to weigh up this evening. Um, to look at whether the um, economic benefits justify those impacts and indeed justify the vast cost. So that's the other aspect of large dams. Um, colleagues here in Oxford, Ben Flyberg, Atif Ansar, um, have uh, systematically looked at the budget and time overruns associated with the construction of large dams. So even if they're worth it in the end, um, is it worth the amount you pay for them up front? Um, and over what time scales do those benefits and impacts um, materialize? So how do we value um, what is bequeathed to future generations in these um, vast and immovable pieces of infrastructure? Um, those are the questions which we're going to examine today in the context of um, two uh, iconic dammed rivers, the Nile and the Colorado. Um, and it's a great pleasure to um, welcome and introduce um, two um, extremely well qualified uh, specialists to talk about those. We're going to hear first from uh, Dr. Kevin Wheeler who's um, an Oxford Martin fellow working um, on the Oxford Martin uh, program on transboundary resource management. Uh, Kevin has been working on both of these river basins for a very um, long time. He's worked on the Colorado for more than 20 years um, and was involved in the negotiations between the USA and Mexico in 2012 on jointly managing droughts and water shortages. Um, and he's currently an advisor to the future of the Colorado River project. And Ken Strasbeck um, has been uh, working for 
practically twice as long um, on uh, uh, river basin management, water resources, um, the economy and the environment. Um, he's now a research scientist at the Joint Programme and Science and Policy of Global Change at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, he's a visiting fellow here currently at the Oxford Martin School, and it's been a, a, a great pleasure and privilege having you in Oxford, Ken. Um, and he's an emeritus professor of um, civil engineering at the University of Colorado. And he's worked in, in many places around the world and for many international organizations, including the, the UN, the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, USAID, and so on. Um, so we're going to hear uh, first from, um, from Kevin and then from Ken. As we've heard, um, uh, Kevin and um, also myself, um, we're uh, part of the Oxford Mountain Programme on Transboundary Resources. Um, this is a, a programme which is looking at both water and energy resources in the context of the Nile and also the Lower Jordan Basin. So looking at um, energy and resource wa water resources in, in Israel, Palestine, and Jordan. And that's taking a systems approach to um, analysis of those resources, both at present and in, in the future, but also looking at the, the, the politics and diplomacy um, of those contested transboundary issues. And we'll hear um, in particular about that program's work on, on the Nile this evening. Um, this evening uh, is being live streamed and recorded, so you might wish to um, bear that in mind um, when you're asking questions and making comments at the end. Um, and uh, we have an online audience as well as this audience in person um, with us in the Oxford Martin School. Um, and the people online will have the opportunity to pose questions using the Crowdcast app. And I'll keep an eye on those questions um, and we'll um, ask them to our two speakers at the same time as, as asking questions from, uh, from people in the room here. So, um, but first, let me um, hand over to our first speaker, Kevin Wheeler. Okay, thanks, Jim. Um, honor to be here. Uh, I've spent a lot of time in both of these basins and given lots of uh, lots of talks on them individually. Sometimes trying to talk about both of them in one time is a challenge. There's so much, so much information. Um, so, uh, transboundary rivers, rivers that cross international boundaries, uh, somewhere between 240, 260 different river basins. Uh, the Colorado has often been called the the, the Nile of the of the, of, of the North of North America, these locations. Um, so I look at a lot of different similarities and differences between them. What lessons can we learn? Uh, what are the critical elements for success? How have some of the problems been overcome through the years and what challenges lie ahead for each of those different basins? Um, and I like to break down a lot of the basins in three sort of key aspects, information, infrastructure, and institutions um, being three sort of key elements to the development process. <coughs> A uh, quick comparison between the two, um, Colorado River, two sovereign countries uh, um, and with, with, with 20 uh, um, sovereign tribal areas as well. Um, the Nile River with 11 countries, um, population 40 million for the Colorado, Nile River 250 million people, so significantly larger. Um, the average annual flow, so it's about four times, the Nile is about four times the Colorado River. If you look at per capita amount of water, the Colorado River is about 500. Um, uh, that's in uh, cubic meters per person per year. Nile River is, uh, is um, uh, somewhat less than that. Both lots of irrigated area um, and huge uh, installed capacity for hydropower generation. So just a little bit, little bit of comparison there. So some things that are very similar, the basins both developed unevenly. Uh, agriculture uses dominate across both basins. 70, 80% of the water use uh, goes to agriculture. Extensive hydropower generation, uh, or and, and, and more so being developed, um, in, uh, in particular the Nile. Uh, municipal needs are growing uh, um, extensively across the basin. Uh, uh, rural to urban transfers are very common. Um, 
major environmental concerns as a result of the of the of the infrastructure construction and consumptive uses. Um, and both basins, almost all the water, all the water, almost all the water is completely used. Uh, so there is no is no water that makes it to the sea in the in the Colorado or very little. Um, and in the Nile, really just water helping to to uh, to push out the um, the salinity. So here's our geography in the Colorado uh, flows from the backside of the Rocky Mountains, uh, where my my home in the States is uh, through the two countries or two. Uh, so just the very end is it cross in, into Mexico. But there's seven states uh, within the United States um, that the rivers cross. We, we call this a federal river. So a lot of complex institutional arrangements to try to wa uh, manage water across state boundaries. Two Mexican states, 5.5 million acres um, or 2.2 million hectares, 40 million people, 22 tribes, uh, wildlife refuges, national parks, large um, uh, infrastructure capacity um, that Ken will elaborate more on. On the Nile, uh, the headwaters, uh, Lake, um, Lake Victoria and Lake Tana are the two headwater uh, reservoirs. Um, from Lake Victoria flows, I'll call the Victoria, the Albert Nile, into the Sud wetlands or Sud swamps, um, where about half of the water is evapotranspirated and then flows northwards as the White Nile to the city of Khartoum. And the Blue Nile wraps uh, out of the highlands of Ethiopia um, and then merges right in the city, right in the center of the city in Khartoum and flows northward uh, as the main Nile through the High Aswan Dam, uh, the largest, largest dam in the, um, in, the, in the basin. And here's the border between Ethiopia and Sudan. And just upstream of the border is the construction of the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, which we'll reference. This is, talk isn't exclusively on that dam, but um, something I work a lot on. So, we often like to look at, at, at the, the hydrology uh, associated with the rivers, and we can see the thickness of the lines being, being proportional essentially to the amount of water. And we can see that most of the water comes from the Ethiopian highlands. Um, uh, and um, yeah, the vast majority, about 85% comes out of Ethiopia in general, uh, but about roughly 50 to 60% of the water that flows into Egypt flows past the, the, the Ethiopian dam site. But there's large amounts of water that's that falls down and evapotranspirated um, in the uh, uh, in the Victoria Lakes area. So, um, just a little bit of a representation of of how much water uh, flows in. So we have a, a, a bit of a, a bit of a reference. And here's where a couple of the large dams, uh, the Ethiopia or the Aswan Dam, High Aswan Dam, and, and the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. So information uh, on the Nile side, information has been collected on the Nile for thousands of years. Um, you can go to the city of Aswan uh, and you can see these amazing uh, walkways where you see um, uh, carved, uh, carved marks where they're, where they're measuring the flood, uh, the flood waters of the Nile each year. Um, uh, so, so around 600 or so, uh, some of the more systematic measurements or, or the measurements that we have right now um, uh, uh, really began with the, with the Nilometers, um, one being right in the center of Egypt in the, the Rota gauge on an island that basically measured what the elevation of, of the flood would be and they would charge higher taxes whenever there'd be higher elevations uh, marked because they knew it'd be a more lucrative year in terms of um, in terms of the, the crop production and droughts whenever that le level was lower. Now we can also see that there a large gap in between and that's kind of the end of the of when they're measuring the, the, the height. I mean it still did here and there but it wasn't really until the 19, uh, 1900s when the more systematic measurements of flow would take place, because that's much more challenging because you have to manage the sediment fluxes or changing through the rivers um, and it's essentially uh, a much more um, scientific rigorous process of, uh, of, of calculating what the flows would be. And that was associated also with the construction of the, uh, uh, the first dams, the, the Low Aswan Dam um, in, in Upper Egypt. The Colorado River, um, started out in the in the the late 1800s, 1870 or so, um, the expedition of of, uh, of Wesley Powell, John Wesley Powell, uh, going down the Colorado and starting measurements in the years thereafter, um, and really goes uh, kind of systematic measurements going back to about 19, uh, early 1900s, um, and we can see um, a very interesting phenomena. The period that shaped the, the the basis for the allocations was this very first zone here this first year before 1922. And all the decisions were made based on a limited amount of knowledge at the time. And as we can see, um, the averages have gone down through through time. So a lot of the, 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 um, the decisions that were made back then, um, they didn't know about climate change at the time, obviously. So 
So measurement, this is a great trip I got to go on last uh, last year where we're trying to act uh, exactly 100 years later after one of the measuring trips, trying to trying to find some of the exact same locations and take measurements from the same places. And since the reservoirs has, have, have uh, dried out in the Colorado River, leaving large depositions of sediment. So this is the deposition from uh, from Lake Powell um, and doing a lot of measurements and trying to see the, how, how the landscape both well it, it, it formed all of this large deposition and then uh, and then now the river is cutting it away again so for information both uh, information has been collected on both uh, rivers pretty systematically starting in about 1900 or so about the turn of the century colorado river uh, basin-wide data availability fairly easy to, to access that data uh, primarily um, by law in the in the u.s making that that data accessible um, in the Nile, it's very fragmented data access. Very difficult to get the data. I've been working there for um, uh, for about 11 years now. It's still incredibly difficult to get data because the governments tend to keep the data for themselves. They don't share the data very readily between the uh, between the countries. Um, however, the Nile Basin Initiative is an institution that's been working on this for a long time. And just in the last few months, they actually post a pretty comprehensive data set um, that allows a lot of the data, at least through 2002, uh, to be published. So progress. Modeling. A lot of what I do is using computer models to analyze how these uh, how the systems could work um, or, or management decisions. So since the 1960s, the Colorado River has been has been studied using decision support systems, and a very common tool is being used across all the different states and between the, the between the two countries called the Colorado River Simulation System. Now. Uh, the Nile Basin has also been modeled extensively and used for decision making. However, very fragmented. Each country has their own their own models. Um, there's been an attempt uh, for the Nile Basin Initiative to have a common model. Um, it's not used very often by the other countries. Um, so you have a very fragmented landscape of decision making uh, as a result of having different analytical tools. Infrastructure. So infrastructure on the Nile really started back with the Low Aswan Dam in 1902, the Sennar and the Jabal Dam in 1925, 1937. This was during the colonial age in, in, uh, in British. Um, in the 1960, 1970 was the uh, was the construction of the of the High Aswan Dam, which dis uh, uh, displaced about 50,000 people, uh, Nubians from the um, uh, from the Sudanese side, and they constructed the Kashmir Herba Dam. 1967, the Rosaris Dam, the Moroi Dam in 2009, the the largest dam in Sudan. The Ethiopia's uh, um, significant construction on the Nile started in the, with the Tikizi Dam in 2009 on the on the Tikizi River, a tributary. The Tana Bellis project in 2009, uh, some more in, in, in Sudan um, recently. And then the GERD, the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, um, is really the, uh, uh, the, the only one that compares uh, to, the high, to this is the High Aswan Dam. They're all very small in comparison to those two, those two uh, reservoirs. The Colorado started about 1901, so kind of a similar time to, for large diversions. Um, um, obviously, the Nile had them much earlier than that, too. but. Um, the Hoover Dam in 1935 to 1938, uh, uh, and that allowed the allowed the irrigation canals to go to California. Um, the All, All American Canal basically was a, a canal just on the north side of the border. Colorado River, uh, River Aqueduct that would supply the municipal areas, um, uh, uh, um, the Metropolitan Water District, so Los Angeles, San Diego. Uh, large trans uh, trans basin diversions coming out of the uh, out of the headwaters. Um, uh, flowing right by my house in, in Colorado. Um, and then Lake Powell being the, the second large reservoir uh, built in the 60s, 1964 to 1974. And then finally, the Central Arizona Project in the 1970s really sort of capped off the full usage of the Colorado River. A lot of small reservoirs as well. So there's also two very large dams on this river as well. So a good comparison point, the Hoover Dam and the Glen Canyon Dam. And basically, this little thing called the Grand Canyon in between. Um, people often say it's a ditch with two big buckets in the sides. It's completely engineered. It's a beautiful, amazing place to be, but you have to recognize it's completely engineered through the middle of it. So, two rivers, but very different. The Colorado River flows into Lake Powell and eventually flows into Lake Mead through that little ditch, and then through a series of small reservoirs, um, relatively small reservoirs, uh, before it goes to Mexico. On the Nile, or they call it in the Abai, in the uh, in the Blue Nile, in the in Ethiopia, uh, passes through the the new side of the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, down through Sudan, a couple of, of much smaller reservoirs, 
reaching, uh, gathering water from the White Nile into the, into the um, eventually the High Aswan Dam and uh, down through Egypt. So you also have both systems dom dominated by two very large reservoirs. Both systems have small reservoirs immediately below very large reservoirs, which should raise red flags for all the engineers that a lot of coordination has to be done to keep, uh, to keep um, uh, uh, any damage from happening downstream. You can't have a large bucket below a small bucket without good, good communication. So this is the effect of both of the rivers um, after the damming. We can see uh, this, is, this is the flows into Mexico, how, uh, how the, the, the incredible amount of variation was basically flattened uh, by the presence of the dams as well as the increasing abstractions and very little water actually makes it to Mexico now. Uh, Mexico does use about 10% of the water. They have uh, rights to that uh, through the treaty, um, but, uh, um, uh, uh, but very little bit actually makes it back to the ocean again. This is the flows coming out, out, out of the High Aswan Dam. We can see the same thing, how it just incredibly flattens the hydrology down and releases only to meet uh, the irrigation needs and municipal needs downstream. So the institutions, real challenging part, both basins uh, went through very uneven development. So over about 60 year time period where the seven basin states um, uh, basically uh, um, were achieved statehood uh, between 1850 to, uh, to 19, 1912, you know, when Arizona joined. So the law of the land would be first in time, first in right. Uh, those that use the water first would have access to the water first. Now that seems like maybe a rational basis, but of course that would lead to significant inequities down the road. Um, uh, the upper basin wasn't developing nearly as fast and they recognized they would lose out to the large agricultural areas in, uh, in California that were growing. So the law of the river, 1922, a compact between the upper basin or the lower basin states and the upper basin states would agree to basically split the amount of water, 7.5 million acre feet. That's a ridiculous uh, term that we use, our, our measurement about 9.25 billion cubic meters. Um, so they basically split that amount of water. And then they said, well, when Mexico, we recognize that Mexico will need water in the future, we'll, we'll, we'll split that obligation. They also would deal with variability by saying 75 million acre feet over 10 years had to pass across the border or the upper states would not cause a, the, the depletions to the flows to go below that. So that should rise big questions. What happens with climate change? Is the upper basin causing climate change? Are they causing it to, to uh, the flows to fall below 75 million acre feet? So that's a big debate that'll be in the Supreme Court soon. And then finally, 1944, a treaty um, between USA and Mexico for 1.5 million acre feet. The Nile also developed very uneven, of course. So population, cultivated area, and difference, differences in development investment. So all the green areas here you see are the large irrigated areas. So really the delta of uh, the delta along, along uh, Egypt. This is an area um, called the Jazeera scheme, uh, one of the largest irrigation areas within, uh, uh, irrigated areas within, within Africa, um, developed in the 1920s and 1930s. And if you look today, Egypt uses about 79% of the water of the Nile. Sudan uses about 18% of the water of the, of the Nile. Um, high, high rainfall, a lot of rainfall, um, uh, agriculture in a lot of areas but the upstream areas don't have control over that water like the downstream areas do. In terms of hydropower, Egypt would um, at one point had the largest amount uh, of energy generation in Sudan. Um, that's changing very rapidly with the development of, of the Ethiopian dams. So we can see the, all the other countries combined had a very small amount of water being used. So a little bit of the history on that, after the colonial independence, um, Egypt and Sudan signed an agreement in 1959 um, and it was for the full utilization of the waters of the Nile. They allocated between themselves 55 billion cubic meters for Egypt, 18.5 billion cubic meters for Sudan, leaving zero for the rest of the countries. So of course, the big question is when Ethiopia or the other countries in the, in the Nile Basin do develop and want to use the water, what will they do? No other countries, of course, recognize or party to or recognize this, this agreement. Um, uh, but the, the, what the countries are now doing is dealing with that reality that the upper basin countries are now ready to use that water. So challenges of, une of uneven development. In the Colorado, California develop, develop first. More abstractions are now desired, more, even though there's no water left. Colorado, New Mexico, Wyoming, Utah, all promise to use more water, want to construct more. more. 
on the Nile, Egypt and Sudan developed first. More abstractions are desired by Ethiopia, South Sudan, Kenya. Sudan and Egypt want to develop more as well. Everyone wants to develop more, but there's just not more to develop. So reallocation. The water is fully used from both of these basins. Upstream wants to develop more. So they really need to develop plans and additional uh, for additional uses, uh, how to coordinate these both for consumptive and non-consumptive uses. So in the institutional development, you have a, a compact and a treaty in the Colorado River side, uh, um, a treaty on the, on the Nile side. And we can see on the Colorado River side, really, well, if you think about an equitable sort of planning for an equitable future, they, they didn't know what the future would hold, except for the fact they, they understood that, that Mexico would need the water eventually. So they really did focus on some type of an equitable future. Um, where on the Nile, the treaties, they're really focused on kind of exclusive capture between, between Egypt, and, Egypt and Sudan. There are clauses uh, for if, they, if the upper countries want to water in the future, but um, that hasn't been uh, enacted yet. So another interesting thing is, is both countries really did a static water allocation as opposed to a dynamic water allocation. So really didn't have any notion of what would climate change bring. If there were less water than the science told them um, at the time, there is no um, mechanisms by which to change those allocations. Um, uh, both within within the Colorado River uh, and within the, the Egypt Sudan Treaty, and of course um, doesn't have the other countries in there as well. So, but there is a difference in the in the commissions. So, on the U.S. side, there's an authoritative commission, the, uh, the International Boundary and Water Commission, who has the power of the of the executive branch uh, to be able to make decisions, and they work in a process of minutes. So, there's a treaty formed, and then and then. I think at 100 or 350 minutes right now. So it's constantly updating this treaty. Every time there's a new element, a new implementation agreement, that's a part of the treaty um, that, that gets added on. Um, uh, so it's a very living, breathing uh, relationship between the countries. Uh, the Nile Basin Initiative has attempted to do something similar. Um, and it was, it was something that started uh, back in the 1990s, uh, originally with all of the countries together. Um, eventually, over over development of the, of of, um, of uh, the, the, up, the upstream countries, Egypt and Sudan withdrew their membership from the Nile Basin Initiative. So the largest water user was not part of the of the River Basin Initiative, um, and uh, Sudan eventually rejoined. Uh, Egypt so far is still frozen frozen its membership. So it really does inhibit the amount of coordination that can happen today. So the big questions: What happens with situations of non-stationarity or climate change? And with that, I'm going to hand over to uh, Professor Ken Stresbeck to talk about the economics. Thank you, Kevin. And I want to thank Charles for inviting me to be here and Jim for hosting me as a Martin Fellow and um, to be able to have this time with Kevin, who we've worked together quite a bit over the last um, few years. Um, one of the things that has gone on, and one of the things I'm not going to do today, is talk about the, the use of water and some of the issues related to the environmental aspects, which we want to get to. We're, we're, tr we're now trying to understand what is the, the role of the economy in the use of water, and how do we measure that? So as we start going about looking at reallocation of water, looking at new projects, how can we measure that so we can do um, a, a good job? And one of the things that came out of this was after the World Commission on Dams, which brought up a number of the issues of the externality and the environmental impacts of dams and how, um, as Jim um, very well spoke about at the beginning, all of these um, impacts that were not um, taken into account there became a shift away from dams. And then there has been a sense of, can we come together in the middle and try to understand these things and really measure the economics? Because there was a sense that there has been an inflation of the economic benefits. And we definitely know from some recent research that there has been an underestimation of many of the costs, not only the environmental and the social costs, but also some of the uh, construction costs and things that have gone on. So as you look at these projects and you look at economic development, one of the interesting things is we break the economic benefits of a dam into three types, the direct benefits, the indirect benefits, and the induced benefits. And the indirect benefits and the induced are generally higher than the direct benefits. 
And so um, the World Bank undertook a, a major study over five years to try to look at case studies and come with a way to, to measure um, these indirect benefits, come with a, a standard way so we could look at those in a, in a proper way. And if we uh, look at that, one of the things we have to do is as we go forward, we wanna make sure how we're looking at this because we've tended to look at things in the past as an economist and Kenneth Bowling, a philosopher economist um, has this great thought, what's the difference between an engineer and, and an economist? And you're dominated by, by, by engineers today, but I do have a degree in economics as well, is if I'm gonna build a dam, I'd rather have it built by an engineer than an economist. We all agree with that? Yes. Uh, nevertheless, though, the economist comes into the picture asking that awkward question as to whether the dam should have been built in the first place. And this is also what we have to look at with, as an economist, we have the dam now. What do we do with the water? We know around the globe that we're taking dams out. They're decommissioning dams throughout um, the United States saying things are changing. We have to think about what's going on. And one of the things we wanna look at in the economics term, which is called the opportunity cost. What is the benefit that would have been gained of an alternative resource? And we're gonna talk a little bit later about the magnitude of these infrastructure that Kevin just showed on these things. Focusing today on large dams, they're very, very expensive. What could society have done alternatively with those large amounts of money? How do, how do we measure that? Can we do that? So one of the things that we try to do is cost benefit analysis. Wouldn't this solve it? Well, one of the interesting things is solve cost benefit analysis um, in the 19th century was developed by the, the famous hydrologist and economist um, Dupuy, who said he was very concerned about how do we put benefits on non-commercial activities or public goods. Um, things that government to put together. So he worked on that quite a bit. And then what happened though, it, it really didn't get applied that much in the 20th century in Europe and it's coming back more now, but where it really took off was in the United States in 1936 when they became part of a federal regulation that the Federal um, Navigation Act of 1936 made it mandatory that all projects must do a benefit cost analysis and the decision will be made if the benefits outweigh the costs. And since that time, that seems like it's solved the issue, but they focus just on a certain set of benefits and a certain set of costs. And what we have to do as we deal with our, our ethics in our approach to, to the world is let's measure all of those and let's do that. And some of them are harder to measure than others. And coming here from um, uh, from a, someone nearby from University College London was Pierce and Moran, and they did this, this nice setup here that total economic value can be, be broken up into human and non-human use. And then within the human use, there's the value and um, of the use value and then the non-use value. And today we're gonna be focusing on this uh, use value, but we have to be working on these other values and that would be a whole other talk in itself. We want to get to look at these big dams and we just uh, just want to put that out there that we understand we need to be doing more in this area and we're taking uh, steps before we run here as we look at this today. So as Kevin pointed out, uh, the Colorado River was there and there was a lot of work, but it need to be taming. And so the city of Los Angeles, which was in California, which you showed that was 1850 when it became a state and it was developing and becoming this great place where people wanted to come to much before the rest. And they wanted to feed themselves and they needed water. Uh, Los Angeles, Southern California is very dry. Um, and so they sent out an engineer to um, uh, Joseph Lipcott to go and check out the Colorado. And as Kevin pointed out, he says, it's an American Nile awaiting regulation. So let's keep that word there, awaiting regulation. Sounds like an engineer to me. And it should be treated, and I think it's appropriate to say, in an intelligent and vigorous manner as the British government has treated its great Egyptian prototypes. Now, I don't know if that's an oxymoron to say intelligent and vigorous British government, but I haven't been here long enough uh, to know. 
but lots of things are happening and, and those who live in glass houses should not throw stones either. So what happened is we had this thing, the Bureau of Reclamation, which was established and Lipcott and others are showing, they're talking about conservation um, and it was moving away from um, Teddy Roosevelt made national parks throughout the country. They were pushing on this idea of conservation. At the same time, there's another group talking about exploitation of natural resources. These two activities going on simultaneously. And then as we look at this, this paradigm, um, Woodrow Wilson's uh, sec interior secretary who was in charge of managing natural resources in the United States, um, this was right, after, right around the uh, 1918, 1920 stated, um, I'm not sure this should be repeated ever again in the Martin School. Every tree is a challenge to us and every pool of water and every foot of soil. The mountains are our enemies. We must pierce them and make them serve the sinful rivers we must curb. I don't think we're going to see that on the walls out here, are we? And then later on, um, well, um, Smythe, who was involved in, in the development from California, said the Colorado River flows uselessly past the international desert which nature intended for its bride. Someday the wedding of the waters to the soil will be celebrated and the child of that union will be a new civilization. Now, what basically they were putting was this, this ethos of let's harness nature for economic good. And where's the environment? It is gone there. And so any civil engineers in the room, we come with the, with the disdain of having helped build this. And basically what we have, Kevin showed some nice pictures of the Colorado. Basically we have a big plumbing system with a, it is totally managed, turned on and off, and it has lost its natural wonder as we do it. And the environment um, and the intrinsic value of water has been lost. So um, what, what was, why would there be a dam? Well, Frank and Delano Roosevelt at the opening of the Hoover Dam in 1935 um, said, for a generation, the people of the Imperial Valley had lived in the shadow of the disaster of the river. And the Imperial Valley is an irrigation area in Southern, Southern um, California that touched the border with Mexico. And it was being fed by a canal that weaved its way between Mexico and United States and major floods would destroy the intakes of it and also um, work along and the, um, the Mexican government were taxing it highly. Every spring they waited the dreading coming of the flood and at the end of nearly every summer they feared the shortage of water for the crops. They awaited the development of cheap power. So he says, what are, what are they doing? Why do we want this color? We want cheap power to, to drive us and that these will have national benefits will, which will be derived from this project and will make them felt throughout the entire 48 states of the United States. So this was a very large investment project that had to be funded basically by the people in the Northeast and Eastern part of the United States that had the money. And this part of the country was looking for that money um, to develop its area. So what do we do to, to meet those demands for cheap power? Um, take the risks of flood and drought away. We build a dam for within and over a year, but how big do we make? So one of the important things here is, as Kevin showed, this is again, the variation in the, in the flow of, of the Colorado River and what they would want, what we want as society is we want safety. We don't want risk. We want to know we're going to get a certain amount of water every year. So if we build a dam, what we can do is on the left there, is what's known as a storage yield curve. So if you don't build a dam, the, the amount of water you're going to be secured with is the firm amount. It's the lowest you'll ever see. And in the Colorado here, it was about this wonderful term called acre feet, million acre feet, was about 5.8. But as you start storing more and more, you can guarantee every year a more and more amount. So they ended up designing the, the, um, the, the Hoover Dam to be about 28 um, million acre feet where Kevin said the range of the, the annual flow is something on the order of 15 to 16. And he can talk about um, the debate on that. So as you spend more money on that, so what is the right amount to spend to get that, that, that benefit? Now, one of the other things about the Hoover Dam was in its link to Egypt is this little fact I found. 
It was the first man-made structure to exceed the masonry mass of the Great Pyramid at Giza. So again, all these connections of why we picked these two rivers is other, many other interesting things, but it's a massive, um, there, there are very many interesting things about the concrete here. But what it, what it did, the other thing to note is we're calling it the Hoover Dam because it started um, being developed under the presidency of Herbert Hoover. Um, however, once Franklin Delano Roosevelt got into power, it was changed back to its original level as the Boulder Dam. And then finally, when Roosevelt um, passed away and he was no longer president, it was put into law to be called the Hoover Dam again. So the Boulder Dam, Hoover Dam are the same. Um, it was just, again, uh, politics. And if you go to Egypt, you find out names of, of pharaohs are wiped out on, on different um, activities because they didn't like it. So what the Hoover Dam was, was going to be up there in the center with Lake Mead. That dam was then going to be able to provide hydropower uh, from there, which would spread out through a distribution known as the Western Area Power Administration, sending it, but primarily sending it to California. And we'll see that in a moment. And then the water would then be controlled, released down, downstream and go to two important things, which we'll look at here. We will have flood control from it. We'll then have water conservation. We'll be able to increase the irrigated land. That is about 600,000 acres to about 1,500. So for a total of about 2 million. And one of the key things here that there will be domestic water supply going to Los Angeles. Los Angeles was a thirsty city and its growth was being limited by water. And so this was allowing it to bring water there. And then they were gonna build an aqueduct themselves, the Metropolitan Water District, more than the cost of the dam itself to bring that water. And they were gonna be paying that water um, for that water about $250,000 a year. Then there was the power. The power from this, when it came online, was already sold for 50 years. They had contracts with um, Los Angeles and Southern California Edison. And then they subcontracted that. And there was also uh, electricity going to Arizona, Nevada, and a number of other towns. So they already had this going on. So what was the cost for the dam? The cost for the dam was about $165 million in 1930 dollars. And you can see the distribution between that. And that was about 1% of the US GDP at that time. But it, it had to be passed and it did not have a benefit cost analysis. It had to be passed by legislation, the amount to be allocated, and they needed all the senators and representatives in Congress from the rest of the country. So for many years, there was a long debate of trying to get the California representatives and the, region, and the others from these regions convince those in the uh, Eastern side to fund this work. And it ended up being about $1.25 per person in the United States at that time. And so um, how were they going to do with the income from this um, power? Well, one of the things is interesting. They didn't charge for the water for irrigation. You just had to pay maintenance fees. And what they did charge for was for the power and that power would pay it back over 50 years. And then the flood control would be paid back over a hundred years. So these impacts would be throughout the region outside the basin. So as Kevin put in that number of 40 million, Many of that was in California. California contributed very, very little to the flow of the, the Colorado, but then it got most of, quite a bit of the water um, in the compact. Very similar situation of the downstream country, which is an arid land, getting water from the upper part of the basin and not contributing much. And we see that similarity between the Nile as well. So we have this, this project and there was so much um, work going on to try to uh, sell this project, the Colorado River Aqueduct, which was bringing that water from the river to um, California. And all of your Hollywood movies are only possible because of this dam. You can see Beverly Hills and Hollywood, that's, that's watered by, by the, the um, Colorado Aqueduct. And then there was the All-American Canal, and its name was, the canal was gonna be all in the United States not to go through Mexico. And they were um, building a new imperial dam to provide it and to provide water to uh, the, the area there. So one of the things that happened is, is how much 
um, did this matter to these, these states? So as Kevin pointed out, the seven states, we see what is the, the state's uh, demand for, for water in the basin. And we can see Arizona, which is downstream of the um, Hoover Dam and Southern California, seven counties. California, 92% of its water came from uh, the Hoover Dam in Arizona is 49%. And you can see the percentage of their industrial uses. Um, however, as we look at this, um, this was an estimate done in 2010, 2014, on how much of the domestic product of each of the states, we call it GDP, this is um, state product, um, but that adds up nationally to be a GDP, and how much employment and labor is related to the water of the Colorado River. And if we look at Arizona and Southern California, there is the dominant use of, of the dominant value of that going to those two states as we look at it. And Nevada, which is um, using some of the water from the, uh, the dam is also there. So these estimates were done and we'll take a, a look at that in a minute. And what you see here, if we look at just California up in the upper um, left-hand corner, the direct benefits, and they're calling it losses. This is the direct uses of the water in California now is estimated at 300 um, million, 300 billion, the indirect are 100, and then the induced benefits. So the induced and indirect actually are more than the direct benefits in California at this point, and a significant number of jobs and labor incomes related to this. And one of the things we want to point this out is for two things that came out of the study from the World Bank. This study is an extreme overestimate. This study was done with a linear input output model. And those numbers there, which were done, assume that for one year, there's no water in the, in the, in the Colorado River. And this is the danger we have when people use simple economics to try to do complex economics. This study was circulated as the value when it is over, way overestimating this work for a number of reasons. There's something called substitution. We can substitute, and this is uh, an economic uh, concept, we can substitute uh, labor and capital, and we can dig a ditch with a, with a truck or with a shovel. And as the relative prices, we'll change what that is. So if we don't have, we can move things, we can adjust things. We're not gonna go to zero if we don't use that. The other thing is that water used in industrial use is very dynamic. It's not static. We can change that. And this is an example of water use over the last um, 25 to 40 years in the US, UK and others that as we've been growing with our GDP, we're able to substitute out and change the amount of water we use. So assuming things are static at this number totally overemphasizes uh, the value of the water. And we'll show that a minute. And, and in some of the debates going on currently around the world, people are using simple, simple linear models and they're greatly inflating the amount of uh, value to put of the water. So as we move from, from Colorado, the, the, the project itself has had incredible benefits. Um, the attempt to measure them has been over, overblown because of this, and it needs to be a proper study where we look at this from the, the role of a, a different approach, and it's something we want to look at. But we now look to the, to the Colorado, I mean to the Nile, and why was the High As One built? Well, this is, Kevin was showing how the, the water arrives there and the variability from year to year. But if you remember your stories, the Nile flooded. And the Nile flooded in a three month season, uh, brought water to the land, and then they grew uh, agriculture as the water receded. They planted the crops and it grew. So they could basically get about one crop a year. So what we'd like to do is be able to store this water behind the dam. And then also we have the year to year variability, which brought floods. So we couldn't build close to the river because it would be destroyed. And then so if we can store that water behind a dam, and Kevin showed these numbers of allocating the water between Egypt and Sudan, by building the High Aswan Dam, we could get that solid line there, which is the Lake Nasa release. So what dams do is take this very variable thing, which is on both ends, the average doesn't mean anything because we either get too much water or too little, and we try to make it and smooth it out so it can be used with certainty. 
So what were the kind of benefits that came from there? Um, saving Egypt from these, these uh, floods and, and uh, droughts, reclaiming more land because now we're able to take and store that water uh, within the year for using later. Um, we could increase and grow rice and sugarcane, which was there. And then importantly, again, we could make cheap hydropower as um, President Roosevelt said. And then also another benefit here was the Nile could now have navigation all year round because they were releasing the water, not just during the high season, saving on um, transport up and down. Now, what was the cost of the High Aswan Dam? Um, back here. Um, it was going to be an enormous undertaking with $1.3 billion. And there's a whole history of what happened with NASA, the UK, Dulles in the United States and the World Bank. And they wanted the 40 million to come from outside and it was going to be these three parties providing that. But then back in, um, due to geopolitics, the Russians came in and they funded the dam, but they cut down the design of the whole scheme and it ended up being about $60 million. Now, I apologize as we move from Apple to here, we, we got a little problem on the, on the uh, pr presentation here, but basically at $60, $60 million, $600 million, the GDP in Egypt at that point was 5 billion. So this is 12% of the GDP in 1960. This is significantly more than the, the the Hoover Boulder Dam, which was 1% of GDP. This is 12%. And it ended up being about $24 per person in Egypt at that time. This is a big activity to take on. And um, was, was it worth it? Well, as we look at different activities, a number of people started to look at that. And another connection here to the University of Colorado, an Egyptian professor of economics who came, he said, this is still a notable tendency in the Middle East to regard the High Aswan Dam as a one-shot cure, not only for the troubles of the Nile, but for all of Egypt's economic and social cures. Such certainly not the case. These problems are complex, deep-rooted, and the potential core is broader in scope. And basically, he was saying this is not going to solve the problem. But more land will raise food, we'll have more electricity again. This is what we need to do, and how do we use that? So there was a hope that th as this went on. Um, we also looked at this, and um, another professor later on, a colleague, wrote a paper on this and said, Egypt provides an exceedingly challenging and interesting laboratory of social and economic development. So these were new things that were happening. And one of the things we found out as we studied it, there was no benefit cost analysis by the Egyptian government or the, the Russians. The little that they did was they took the cost, they took the benefits, no discounting, no other costs, and we found out that there was a PhD done at um, UCLA by uh, a Lebanese professor, and he came up and studied and saw that if you used proper discounting, the, um, the rate of return for the dam would be about 21%, and that's just for the direct benefits. The Egyptian government was saying it was 44%, and one of the things that he did in that 21% is take into some, one of the first studies to take into some of the, the externalities that, that went on. So what, what did the High Aswan Dam do? In addition to these direct benefits, it was a catalyst for growth. We see that after that investment in agriculture and transportation increased dramatically because now the Nile wasn't being flooded every year. We could invest in better um, better technology and better equipment as we did that. As we look at this, one of the things we see with electricity is this is um, um, work that shows what is the um, GDP or your wealth as a function of electric use per capita. So that if you provide electricity, it can be a stimulus for economic growth. And that was the model that they had in mind. And we see that throughout and we definitely saw that this happened. Now, one of the things about the direct benefits is that when they did these estimates of the, the economic benefits back in the 1960s, the world value of the world market prices for grains have continually declined over time. So the expected benefits of the dam, which were about 50% agriculture, 50% energy, dropped dramatically. However, 
to make up for that, oh, wrong way. the value of energy skyrocketed over that period. So what used to be um, going to be 50% ag, 50% um, energy turned out to be now 82% energy and 18% ag. The big benefit of the dam was the energy, which led to the development of sectoral change in the economy and large um, industries that provided employment and also um, used the resources, a lot of it. So what this did is over time, you also, what was the value of the role of the dam? It went from being, um, when it came on, it was 60% of the energy, electrical energy generation in the country to now below 10% as of 20, um, 2012 and continuing to drop. And the share of ag GDP when this turned on was 30% and now it's down to about 10%. So the role of it in the economy is changing. So this idea of things being dynamic are really important. So how do we measure these things? And what we decided is, as we look at this, we did a quick study to look at using a tool called a computable general equilibrium model, which we won't get into now, but it's not linear. It allows substitutability, and we'll see an important point. And we looked at a study here to say, what is the value of that dam? So we assumed that before the dam, you would have all of this um, flows coming, and we'd look at the benefits that would come, and we took the average of those benefits. And what if you then took that and you have the dam, so you now have a steady flow? Well, what we saw with that is you would get an increase of that, the number to the far, uh, far right-hand side, the 2.6 billion, 26 uh, billion Egyptian pounds per, uh, 260 billion Egyptian pounds per year. That's what you get if you have the steady release. If you take the average of all the flows, you just get the lower average of 255. This increase 5 billion um, per year is that benefit that you got because we are, we're not having that variability anymore. But there's more than that because then there's other induced benefits. But one of the key things that, that this analysis showed is in the bottom line here, um, where we see the benefits of about 5 um, billion Egyptian pounds, if you use the linear input-output approach that was used in the Colorado I showed you before, you get a benefit of about $34 billion, almost a six times increase because of the fact of nons of uh, you can't substitute and things don't change in the economy. So using these simple tools, these simpler tools lead to an overestimate of the value. Now, one of the things we then looked at is what happened? What is the the impact of the value of the risk. So if we look at something looking at risk assessment, we've come up and we studied and said that, well, if the static, static risk neutral is about 4.9 billion per year, if you add the dynamic effects of capital shocks, you get about another 1.1. But the risk premium of this, if we're a standard uh, risk user using a risk factor of one, we add about another $1.1 billion of the value to the economy of not having this variability. If you put that together, we get about 2.7% of the GDP in 1997 can be attributed to the value of the dam. So if you took the dam out in 1997, you would have a drop of about 2.7% in your GDP. And this isn't even including the induced benefits of the value of the land and the flood control along the Nile Basin. Now, if you have an extremely risk averse, which the Egyptians tend to be, you can get uh, to almost 4% of GDP. Now, what about Ethiopia? Well, if we look at Ethiopia, where is it? Ethiopia is at 40% of its GDP at ag. We saw when Egypt in 2060 and 1960, they were at 30%. Um, it's at the same place, industrial sector is growing. The GERD will double electricity what do we expect to happen um, when the GERD comes online? Well, a number of um, economists have done some computable general equilibrium work, and they're all showing under different scenarios um, a benefit, an annual benefit of the GERD at somewhere about a billion dollars. With the current GDP of Ethiopia at about 100 million, 
This will mean about a 1% um, increase in direct benefits to, um, to Ethiopia of, of the GERD. So one of the things that we looked at is one of the important things as we look at development is there are these eight principles, but the summary of these principles are things are dynamic. They're going to be changing over time. We have to be measuring all the aspects of it, not just the direct benefits, but we have to look at the indirect benefits, the induced benefits. And I want to add, we have to look at them on both sides of the ledgers, the benefits, but then also the costs. And we have to come in and figure out ways that are acceptable to understand what are the costs we have made to the environment as we look at that. Now, one of the things that's important to all of these was what was the role of this? Was it economic, social growth, or was it symbolism? And so what we've seen in Nasser at the opening of, of the dam, he said, we are joined, here we are joined political, social, national, military battles of the Egyptian people, welded together like the gigantic mass of rock that has blocked the course of the Nile. And then again, what, um, what was on the pamphlet that they shared about this was the dream has long been cherished by all Egyptians is now being realized that as one, as we can control the Nile. So this was really a, a dual purpose technical as well as a um, powerful symbol that Egypt had come into the modern world. The same thing is true that was a symbol that, that the Hoover Dam was. It was at a very difficult time for the U.S. in the middle of the depression. It was jobs for people. There were great unemployment. It meant jobs. And they did something they were very proud of that had never been done. It was the largest uh, dam at the time. And that this, he said at the end, is a template for future public work. It will be, it will be reckoned modest indeed, what this costs are. And that this was coalescing both social and economic community. So these large scale projects are many times not done without an acceptable benefit cost analysis. They're not, they can be, and I think they are profitable in that way, but they are not looked, they haven't looked at the costs that they brought, but they bring a great symbolism to the countries that rallies around them. And if we think about great engineering feats, that's generally what's there. So with that, I'm very happy that we can end and be ready for questions on all sides of this. Thank you. Thank you, and we'll take that as applause for both of our speakers. Come on up to the um, platform. Um, and we're open for questions now. We've got about um, 25 minutes until we close. Um, there's a microphone at the back there, and I'm looking for questions online as well, so our um, online audience can ask questions too. Um, but uh, do we have any questions to start with? Yes. And perhaps you could uh, introduce yourself as, as well before you ask your question. Vision architect. So my question is to do, and I'm from Egypt, uh, how to assess the, the cost of the relocated Nubians uh, and uh, the lost uh, heritage under the Lake Nasser and also the, the major um, relocation of some of the World Heritage Monuments because of the dam. So is there a, a way to measure that against uh, the model that you have uh, okay. presented? Um, I'm not seeing another question for now, so we'll go to that. Maybe as we go along, we'll pick up um, several. But um, first of all, perhaps some description of actually what happened yeah. um, and then the difficult question of valuation. So what what happened with the, the building of the dam? There were, as, as um, Professor Hall mentioned at the beginning, there are upstream and downstream effects of the dam. So one of the effects upstream is there was an a Nubian civilization living there of, of people that were now flooded out in addition to about over a hundred monuments that were flooded from ancient Egypt. 
there is the famous monument Abu Simbal, which they moved up onto the edge and, and protected that. But there are numerous other heritages that were lost. And then the other side was downstream because they had the dam in Egypt has always been rich with sediment. I mean, the, the Nile has been rich in sediment that was made it so fertile. With this dam, the, the sediment fell out in the back of the dam. So it was no longer available downstream. And so now the soils were not as rich. And so fertilizers had to be used to replace that lost fertility. And in Shabil, in his work um, on his PhD, he actually measured that, the value of doing that. So that was one of the first times they did that. The other thing was because of the sediment and the changing of things, we lost the entire um, sardine um, fishery of the Eastern Mediterranean. So there was a loss to society and to people in the Mediterranean Sea, far thousand miles away from the dam because of that impact in the Mediterranean Sea and ecological damage there. There was also, because there was no um, sediment anymore, all the existing dams, they were called barrages, that were used to supply water to the irrigation and the bridges were being at risk because of, of erosion, because now there was no water. So they had to redo all of those bridges. There was now, because you had water all the time, schistosomiasis was becoming a disease that was hurting the, um, uh, the many of the farmers. So then the one on the other side was now they were able to have fishing in Lake Nasser. So there was a small recovery, but if you like Nile perch versus sardines, that's a taste issue. So there was some of that, but then there was moving all of the people. So these are all what we call externalities. There are costs, there are other environmentalist externalities related to salinity that, that the lands now were having water put on and not having the flood flushing them out. So the um, Egyptians had to put tile drainage into the, into the soils. So all these things have to be measured appropriately. We still, as applied economists and natural resource economists, don't do a good job of measuring these social impacts and measuring environmental impacts. And even how do we come about in doing intrinsic value? What is the value of having this fishery? And so it's a debate. And that's why the, at the World Commission on Dams really pointed this out. And then there was a sense to just list everything and say, these were bad. And then over here is, and your, and your benefits were too low. So we're trying to work on both now. We're trying to look at what were, what are the benefits and then how do we measure these, these benefits? And there's been something called ecosystem services, which is trying to put an economic value to environmental um, uh, uses, but we're still not doing a good job and not doing a good job with social benefits. The other side, and uh, we can, I'd love to have this discussion because we know it's not there. And the, the World Bank tries to do social um, protections and we try to do environmental protections. We're not, we're still not doing it as well as we should, but how, how do we measure these values and, and how do we look at the, the part of society that's benefited from this? And it's a big issue, and this is a big issue that now moves to the debate of food security versus food self-sufficiency. So if you're pushing to grow as much food as you can, you want to dam as many rivers as you can to grow the food, and that's making it self-sufficient. You're growing it yourself, but at what cost? And so that becomes other issues there. So maybe some in the people in the audience may have some additions to that, or I know this has been discussed in the Martin School, the future of food. It's real issues that we have to debate and we have to have the real numbers on both sides properly measured. Thank you for that, Ken. Um, uh, there's a question in the room here, but I'll ask one um, which is coming online, which is um, specifically about the Gurdon. It's a question for Kevin, which I, um, I know he has an answer to. Um, so I'll pose it here. So. Um, uh, the GERD is a hydropower dam um, and will not reduce. This is the question from which comes from um, Nemo 
Semret, um, but others have endorsed it. It won't reduce the flow downstream um, and will help regulate droughts and floods. Um, for the same amount of storage, will the GERD compare to um, the high Aswan Dam um, with, in terms of reduced evaporation losses because it has a smaller surface area? So um, I think there's, there's a question about relative evaporation losses, which is a, uh, uh, is, is a topic on the Nile. And also perhaps you could comment on the non-consumptive versus consumptive use of water in the system. Yeah, just so, that, so everyone's familiar, the, the location of the Ethiopian dam is on the downstream, the farthest point downstream, essentially, in, in, with, in the Blue Nile within Ethiopia. So physically, uh, Ethiopia can't divert water from this dam. It, it is strategically located there for probably many, many reasons, but um, it is very true that it's non-consumptive. You can't pull water out other than maybe some small areas that will pump some water for some irrigation areas. But it, Truly, is not non-consumptive in terms of um, uh, in terms of its uh, um, water supply. It'll the more water that passes through, um, uh, that'll just generate electricity. It just changes the timing of the water going downstream. Um, evaporation is an interesting question. There's you see a lot of debates about will increase evaporation, decrease evaporation. And I've done quite a bit of looking into this. Well, it depends on how wet it is. After that, you can imagine if everything refills in the end and both reservoirs are full, then you have two reservoirs there that are going to evaporate. So in that case, when there's a lot of water, you'll actually relatively have more evaporation. However, if it's really dry, you only have, and, and you are, um, and you've dropped the Aswan Dam down lower, which there's a much higher evaporation right in the Aswan Dam, you're maintaining water in the Ethiopian Dam, you will have less evaporation. So it just depends on how much water is actually in the system at the time. Initially, what will happen is while the GERD is filling up, the Aswan Dam will go down. And during that period of time, you will see an evaporation savings. However, if, if, if projections are, are as, I, as I would guess, um, uh, both reservoirs will start to increase, you'll hit a point where there'll actually be a little bit more evaporation um, than, there was, than there would be beforehand. But the most important thing is to not get wrapped up in evaporation because we're talking about one to two billion cubic meters out of a system that's 90 billion cubic meters. So people start to get really wrapped up on, well, what's going to be, is it going to increase or decrease? Don't worry about that. Um, the management is a much bigger issue. How much water everyone's using is far bigger issue than the amount of evaporation. Because that's, we can't tell exactly. It depends how, how wet it's going to be in the fourth of years. Thank you. Let's go to this question in the room here. Hello, um, Rob Smallwood. I'm an old student at the University, but I've been reading National Geographic for, for years. Um, and uh, when I was in France, I went to the, um, oh, I live and work sometimes, there's the River Creuse, where they have the very first uh, hydroelectric barrage in the world, which has been running nonstop since 1861. And um, it's uh, by contrast with the nuclear power station up the road on the on the Loire, which has uh, clapped out after about 50 years, and it just it looks like a uh, a weir, and you, they they channel the water into a central uh, channel with water wheels, and it just runs like that. I think they use it in the Mekong actually. The, the Vietnamese have copied it. Why? Right, well, that's a very good example. That's what set me off thinking about electricity production and dams. Uh, because uh, the question is, um, have you ever, are they getting together any uh, plans to da use the dam system on the sea, on a sort of rocky coastline, and uh, produce, if you've got 50 meters of water, you can actually uh, block off the water and install some generators on land, uh, pump the water through the, the dam system, and then, then put it through a generator, and then it will just go straight back into the sea. It's a bit of a pipe dream of mine, but um, I'd like to know your professional opinion. So we've got a couple of engineers here who may wish or may not um, wish to comment on um, tidal energy um, or other forms of pump storage on the coast. It would be a challenge for pumping water up, especially as you don't you, you don't want the saline intrusion going any higher. So a lot of the uh, the agricultural areas in the in the Nile Delta, they're um, they're very challenged right now with the saltwater intrusion. Um, with less water flow coming, fresh water flow coming down, you have a backing up of the seawater, um, uh, creating higher salinity soils. So 
if you were to come up with something, first off, it's very flat land in the Delta area. So it'd be difficult to have the amount of head, the amount of elevation to do that. Um, and you'd have to, you'd be putting salt water where you probably don't want salt water to be, would be my, my guess, but maybe there's smart ways to do it. I'll give you an economic perspective. So one of the big issues about energy is the time of day. And we talk about peak energy, which has much higher value than at non-peak time. So that's why when they have pump storage, which was mentioned before, you pump water up and then let it fall down. And because we have friction and other things, you have to use more energy to lift it than you get when it falls down. But peak energy is anywhere from two to eight times as valuable as the energy at other times. And right now when we have solar and wind, we have excess energy, we could be using that to use that excess to pump. So pump storage is a valuable um, activity that can be done, but not necessarily on the coast coastlines where there is sufficient energy ahead where that can take place and there are two reservoir systems. But um, mo most of these things are coming online technologically and it's the, the economics that's keeping them from being implemented. Um, we've got three questions and uh, four now, in fact, which five um, we'll come to in a moment. Um, first of all, um, I'm going to ask combine two questions here um, uh, about um, transboundary institutions um, and a very a, quite a broad question from uh, um, from Mohammed uh, Fardinia um, about how in, in international institutions can help the water management in the basins, which is something you've um, worked on, Kevin. And then a kind of leading question from Paul Block, um, which is a uh, comment on the um, functioning more or less effectively um, about water sharing plans in the Colorado. And his question is, what are the prospects for water sharing policy amongst the riparians of the Eastern Nile. So over to you, Ken. <laughs> um, uh, so um, international river basin organizations, uh, there's a lot of different form, forms of them. It's a very challenging thing to set up. Um, uh, they, they're going to operate in terms of whatever self-organization. There's the notion of international water law, um, which is generally very broad, non, um, uh, not, not specific, and the basin organizations would have to adopt those, uh, those principles. Now, most um, river basin organizations do um, try to structure uh, international water law to meet to meet their own um, sort of agreed on principles. Now, what could uh, part of that was what what could other organizations do to support that? Um, certainly issues such as, as data management, um, uh, monitoring systems, those types of things that uh, take a lot of collective effort between all the different riparians. Um, and you have collection of data, you have quality assurance, quality control across boundaries. Um, you can't uh, assume that everybody is going to um, simply provide data and everyone else is gonna believe what the data is. Um, there'll immediately be disagreement. So there's, there always has to be some sort of mechanism by which information is, is, is cross-checked. The Colorado River, for example, uh, data is collected on both sides of the river. They get together, they compare the numbers, um, they decide, well, what is, what, what's the official numbers going to be? Um, and they do that regularly, constantly. Um, that's, that has to happen in any river basin organization. Um, uh, obviously mutual investments. Um, so yeah, so I'd say, Support in terms of in terms of the legal side, support in terms of the data information side, um, uh, and then investment potential. Great, thank you. All right, so we'll go to three of the questions in the room. There's stuff. I missed that. Paul's question on there too. Ah, uh, yeah, no, that was actually a very important question. If you have the answer to that, then we'll all be happy. Yeah, re so, re re yeah, rephrase it because I don't know if I have. Um, so, is what are the prospects for? Um, uh, cooperative water management on the Eastern Nile? Oh, I, that's, that's the million dollar question. Um, uh, I think there's a lot of, um, uh, I mean, a, a lot of it comes down to internal politics in the countries. 
uh, uh, certainly there's challenges there, there in, in all the countries that I work in, there's, there's a, there's a strong desire by, by some of the sectors to be able to come to an agreement. Other sectors within the, the societies are very resistant to agreements. Um, uh, so it, it, a lot of depends on what the countries themselves are willing to do within their own politics. Um, ultimately, um, uh, certainly we know that, that all countries can benefit pretty significantly if there are cooperative arrangements uh, that would that would potentially incorporate um, uh, investment potential, uh, uh, whether there's a water sharing agreement would be very difficult unless there is the entire base and the entire Nile Basin um, in, involved. And all the countries are trying to stay away from the notion of water sharing agreements right now um, because they're so politically charged. But trying to change the notion from water sharing agreements to benefit sharing agreements or trying to look at what what are the um, what is the what are the objectives of the country isn't necessarily to have a lot of water but is to have development is to have economic growth is to have the different benefits derived from the water as opposed to this amount of water belongs to me so that those types of shifts I think are probably what's necessary thank you right so there's the um, question from the gentleman at the back who's been waiting patiently um and then we'll pick up two more um yeah hi thank you uh, so much so i'm actually a historian of energy and so i i think quite a bit about both of these systems and i really appreciated the discussion that both of you offered of references um made by american engineers and regulators that analogize to the nile what i'm wondering about is whether in the past or in the present you see analogies being made in the opposite direction either in the past um, by colonial British engineers and planners or by Egyptian, Sudanese uh, or Ethiopian planners. Okay, thanks for that. Um, we'll stay on this side of the room, just in front of you. And take, Thank you. Hi, I'm you. Caroline, one of your former students in WSPM from last year. I was wondering the point that you made about decommissioning dams and whether that looks like a viable option for the Colorado River in the political landscape at the moment and what that would even look like whether it would be a success hydrologically okay and finally the gentleman with the, the hat thank you very much mr chairman i've enjoyed your presentation and as you know there are about 286 you mind um, just introducing yourself to oh my name is Workana Galvesa. i'm a research fellow at Uhuru center for practical ethics i'm um, from ethiopia so as i said i have enjoyed your presentation and to raise a number of important issues and as you know there are about 286 transboundary river basins and very often downstream countries are not willing to allow upper stream repairing countries to use this rivers so uh, most of the time therefore they unilaterally exploited these rivers so my question is general so what is your view about transboundary water justice can you reflect on that how can they use or benefit from shared water without excluding others thank you okay so um three questions and then which i'll encourage you to ask quickly because then we can take three from the other side of the room before we close um first on uh historically what have people learned from the colorado maybe you can take that one ken um then dismantling of dams on the colorado why don't you take that one as well and um, then transboundary water justice, the hardest one, we'll give to Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so quickly on the history, there's a famous, um, that Haile Selassie, who was emperor, he came and visited the Hoover Dam and said that he wants one of those for his country. And so they were very famously in 1950s, the US Bureau of Reclamation went and developed the, the plan, which was four dams, and for a number of years, the World Bank and others were trying to implement that. And um, that ended up with the GERD, which was not part of that plan. So that, that was a 
one of the linkages to that, as well as um, many Egyptian and uh, Ethiopian engineers traveling to to the Europe, Europe and to the US being trained on those cities and many, many tours of the Colorado. It was a study tour that many engineers would take. So there's been that influence. Do you want to say thing, something about removing dams on the Colorado? No. Yeah, Kevin. All right. Okay. And wait, wait, wait. On, on that one as well. In the current climate. <laughs> um, these large dams would be very, very, very hard pressed to ever remove them. Um, there's, there's certainly, uh, certainly a lot of desire to make them more flexible than they are. In particular, one of the challenges. So th there's removal of dams that's happening in, 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 in some of the areas on the Snake River, um, uh, for example, not that's on the Columbia side, but the. Um, uh, where the, the dam no longer serves a purpose. Um, uh, so there's some smaller ones that, that's happening. Now, when you talk about these large dams, um, uh, unless there is a viable energy substitute, it would be very difficult to remove them. Unless there is a different way to manage floods, it would be difficult to remove them. However, one of the challenges now is the drought has both reservoirs so low, there's a strong argument, well, they should put all the water into one, and let the other one go down to Deadpool and stop generating electricity. And that's that's valid as well. Um, uh, a good argument is to redrill. So sediment transport's a big issue in this because these are big sediment deposition. Um, if 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 they could redrill some of the uh, the diversion tubes from the upper from the Glen Canyon Dam to allow sediment to pass into the into the, the Grand Canyon, that could potentially be beneficial for the ecosystems. Potentially be harmful too. Um, depending on which fish you care about. Um, uh, so there are some uh, some debates on whether one of them could be done more flexibly, one with the Glen Canyon Dam, dam in particular. Um, I think it's one of, one of scale. Some of these large dams, they, you know, it's funny. They, they build these dams and they sort of say, this is for the next 50 or 100 years, but knowing that society is going to keep fixing this dam indefinitely, good question. One of my favorite places in Sudan, next to the Meroe Dam, is a giant, giant dam, right next to some beautiful Sudanese pyramids. And I was thinking, I was thinking, I wonder if the engineers from these Sudanese pyramids had any idea that a giant dam would be sitting next to it. And I wonder if these, if these in, dam engineers think that their dam is going to be covered by sand in another 500 years or so. Um, could be. Um, Oh, transboundary water, trans justice. water justice. Um, so t the two different major competing paradigms uh, within, the, and I'm not, I'm not a lawyer, um, is uh, um, reasonable equal utilization of waters. Uh, the other is no significant harm. And these are the two paradigms that are that are um, constantly un under tension. So the, um, the, uh, the, the, the upper basin um, in both basins in the Colorado River and in the Nile, uh, they suffered from not having slower development through time. And they say that, uh, well, now is our time to develop more, even if it requires taking away from those that are using the water downstream. Understand that perspective. The other perspective of it is the societies that have become completely dependent upon that water downstream. Um, when you go to California and you see the value of that water being used um, in California, uh, it is um, in Colorado, my home state, we can't generate enough, the same economic value um, of it in the, up, upper, in the, upper, in the upper basin. Um, the Nile is a different situation where, where the, the Ethiopia has not benefited from the flows of the Nile throughout history. Well, Egypt has benefited greatly from it. <clears throat> um, so it's really trying to find where is, I mean, is there a common, it's a rhetorical question in some ways because, um, to what extent can there be a trade-off? Um, to what extent can efficiency help out? Um, the, what Ken was talking about, recognizing the value of hydropower um, versus the value of agriculture is gonna be a key thing, um, especially as Ethiopia transitions, um, that, that benefit of hydropower um, is going to be enormous for Ethiopia and for the region in general. And the interesting thing is the more dams Ethiopia builds, the better it is for Egypt and Sudan because they generate more electricity with it. The value of that electricity become, 
it becomes more valuable to let that water go across the border than it is to divert it within. So a lot of it comes down to those economics. Now, of course, Ethiopia wants to develop their own resources. And the question how much um, they, 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 they'll want to withdraw, and that's, that's a difficult question. Um, how much physically can they use? Uh, um, but trying to find a middle spot between those two. But certainly, those are the two extreme ends. Um, and they're both, they're, they're both valid. And with that, I'm afraid we have to close. So I'm sorry to the people on this side of the room who were um, had some questions and also a number of, of, of really good questions online here as well. But um, uh, and I should, though you won't be able to answer it, I must acknowledge Blessing's question about um, the extent to which we haven't talked about the impacts of dams on communities and the ways in which communities um, can or should be involved in a participatory way in decision making about dams, which was one of the main points um, made by the World Commission on dams. Nonetheless, we've got enough um, here in, in the room and on the, on, on the iPad here um, to keep us going for several more hours, and I won't be forgiven if we do that. So I must um, thank once again um, our speakers and our audience for joining us this evening.